Who am I? Who am I? That's a big question that you must have asked yourself. But how much data would you need to answer that big question? And what type of data? I love books, and I often turn to my favorite books for the answer. If you could choose just one book to give to your child to help them ask that question, who am I? What book would you choose? And then, how would you teach them to read that book? When I was young and learning to read, <clears throat> I loved the books of the American author, Dr. Zeus. One of my favorites was One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. On page 56, there's a wonderful Who Am I? Who am I? My name is Ish. On my hand, I have a dish. I have this dish to help me wish. Who am I? I've been asking this question ever since I was young, ever since I learned to read. Who am I really? Who am I inside? What links me to my past? What can I predict about my future? I ask a lot of questions. I asked my mother, what should I talk about at TED? She said, why don't you tell them about the book? Ah, the book. When I was born, my parents gave me a book, a big old book. They said to me, this book will help you learn who you are. It is the, tells the history of our family. We got it from our parents, and we gave a copy to you. It's your unique book. Look after it. You are the guardian of the book. I was very excited. There was no title on the cover, so I opened it up, and inside there were millions and millions of letters. But I couldn't read. I asked my father, please, can you teach me to read? So he taught me to read. He taught me the letters, and how, then how the letters come together to form words. What does this word mean, I asked my mother. Well, she said, it depends on the context. It depends on what comes before and what comes after. It seems so complicated, but slowly I learned to read. Do you remember your excitement when you learned to read for the first time? I carried the book around with me everywhere. <clears throat> one day I spilt coffee on one of the pages. I was very upset. Don't worry, my mother said. Your book will have coffee stains on some of the pages, but you can still read the letters, you can still read the words, Look after it. You are the guardian of the book. I took the book away with me when I went to university, and there I discovered that the book had a name. It was called The Genome. The Genome is a book with three billion letters of DNA. These letters are called nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, A, G, C, T. And these letters come together to form words and we call those words genes. And the meaning of those words depends on the context, depends on what comes before and what comes after. It all seemed very complicated, but I spent the next three decades learning to read that genome book and to understand its meaning. Each of you has a genome of three billion letters. Each of you is the guardian of a book, and each of you is unique. Look at the person next to you. Look at the color of their eyes. Look at the size of their nose. Look at the shape of their smile. The difference between you and the person next to you is three million letters. Now, that might seem like a lot at first, but that also means that you have 2,997,000,000 letters in common. Now, that's big data. There's something I forgot to tell you about my childhood. When I was born, my parents gave a book to my twin brother, Matthew, who was born the same day as me. Now, monozygotic twins have exactly the same genome book. There's a real who am I problem. How can the same book produce two people who are different? And we noticed that the older we got, the more different we became. 
How can it be that twin monozygotic twins have exactly the same genome sequence and yet they change with age? Could it be the context? Could it be that they live different lives? Could it be the coffee stains? We both went off to work. We both went off to work in the United States. <clears throat> he met a beautiful American woman and he decided to stay there. I met a beautiful French woman. Ooh, she's got a nice genome, I thought. Perhaps, w perhaps one day we could write a book together. <laughs> and so we did. We had wonderful children, and we gave each of them their own unique book. And we said to them, this book will help you learn who you are. It, is, it contains the history of our family. We got it from our parents, and we gave a copy to you half in English and half in French. <clears throat> Your book is unique. Look after it. You are now the guardian of a book. When I came to France, I had to learn a new language. I had to learn to read all over again. I knew the letters, but, and, and some of the words looked familiar. I know this one, I said to my wife. Well, she said, it depends on the context. It depends on what comes before and what comes after. If it has an accent grave, then that's le gène, that's your English gene. But if it has a circumflex, then that's la gène, and that's an embarrassing problem. Wow, so the accents change the meaning of the words without changing the letters, I said. C'est génial. <laughs> oui, et tu es un génie, she replied. So I learned to read all over again. Genetics became la génétique and I discovered the new science of epigenetics, which became epigenetic with the accents. Epigenetic accents change the meaning of the genome without changing the, the meaning, <coughs> without changing the letters. In my lab, we study the tiny molecular enzymes that put on and take off these epigenetic accents. We hope that one day we will be able to correct these accents and change them in cells with disease. For example, cancer is a disease that has both genetic mutations in the letters of the DNA and changes in the epigenetic accents. We cannot easily correct the letters, but we can perhaps change the accents to restore the correct reading in cells with disease. Epigenetic marks are linked to the metabolism of the cell and respond to what happens outside of the cell. In this way, they are direct a direct link between our inner selves and the outer world in which we live. Epigenetic marks can be affected by what we eat, by the pollution we breathe, by the lives we live. And perhaps even small habits, like drinking too much coffee, can leave marks on the genome that, like coffee marks on a page, will be a memory of the lives we've lived. And perhaps these memories will be transmitted to our children on the pages of their books. Man has been reading books for centuries. First, just specialists, prophets, and priests could read those books. And then the Gutenberg printing press brought books to the masses. Suddenly, everyone could enjoy the excitement of reading books and discovering the secrets inside. The word gene was coined 100 years ago to describe those genetic words. 50 years, 50 years later, Watson and Crick, together with Rosalind Franklin, dis described the double helix structure of the DNA molecule. And this gave us clues about how to read DNA sequence. Fifty years later, at the end of the 20th century, we began to publish the sequence of the first genomes. The first man to have his entire genome sequence was Jim Watson, the very man who 50 years earlier had given us the DNA structure. Now, it took many years and cost billions of dollars to sequence the first genome. It was, if you like, one small step for a man one giant step for mankind. But today, it costs less than $1,000 to sequence a genome. If everyone in this room tonight put one euro in a box on the way out, 
we could sequence my genome and publish it by the end of the week. And my brother Matthew would be thrilled because we would be sequencing his genome too. So your children will have the, ge the sequence of their genomes, of their unique book. But having the DNA sequence will not be enough. They will have to learn to read those letters and those words with the accents, with the context. The genome and the epigenome is probably the most amazing book that man has ever read. It will teach us about our past. It will help us predict our future, and it will help us to understand what makes us unique. But will we use this information to bring us closer together or to push us further apart? Will we focus on how much we have in common, or will we decide to focus on what makes us different, genetically or epigenetically? And all this genetic data is connected with all the other data that we've heard about at TED tonight. The genome is constantly interacting with the environment. We talk a lot about the environment today. We are finally taking collective responsibility for this beautiful planet. Its mysteries contains, contain clues to our future. We are all guardians of the planet. But we are also all guardians of the genome book. We have a responsibility for the book that we will transmit to the next generation and for the planet with which it will interact. Dr. Zeus concludes, so if you wish to wish a wish, you may swish for fish with my ish wish dish. So tonight, let's swish for fish. My wish is that collectively we learn to read this amazing book. First, by learning the letters, the nucleotides, by focusing on the strategies and technologies to sequence more and more human genomes, and then the words, the genes, and then the epigenetic accents and the context. We, learning to, uh, we hope that one day we will be able to manipulate these accents to use epigenetic drugs that will change la gene back to le gene to restore the normal reading in cells with disease. It may be hard to learn to read, but we will be amazed at the beauty and the poetry in this ancient text. It is time for all of us to learn to read genetic and epigenetic big data. And what about you? Aren't you curious? Don't you want to answer the question, who am I? Thank you.